crises at home and abroad for President Trump. The White House attempts damage control in Syria as Democrats build their case for impeachment. Who is the frontrunner in the 50th? With the incumbent facing a criminal trial, his party holds off on making an endorsement. And 30 years ago, disaster struck California. How the Loma Prieta quake changed the way we prepare for earthquakes. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer. Joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today, KPBS reporter Priya Shreether, Tony Perry, former San Diego bureau chief for the Los Angeles Times, Michael Smolens, columnist with the San Diego Union Tribune, and Gary Robbins, who covers science and technology for the Union Tribune. Well, the Speaker of the House chastised the president, storming out of the Oval Office. Each claimed the other had melted down. A parade of State Department officials continues describing impeachable acts in the president's scheme to shake down a foreign leader for dirt on a political opponent. Meanwhile, the president abruptly greenlights an invasion of northern Syria by Turkey, leaving U.S. allies in the lurch and causing broad condemnation from Republicans. The turmoil engulfing the Donald Trump administration and Washington at large seemed to somehow accelerate this week, a week that also marked the passing of a leading Democratic Trump critic and a marathon debate by Democrats vying to take on Trump in 2020. A lot to talk about, Tony. Start with Trump's uh, sudden and shocking to Republicans, as I said, and Democrats alike, this decision to abandon the Kurdish allies. Uh, why the stark reaction? Well, we've, we've done this before to the Kurds. Uh, we abandoned them in World War I, where they fought for the Allies. We abandoned them after World War II, when they fought for the Allies. And of course, in, in this case, they fought uh, on our side in both Iraq and then in Syria, 1,100 uh, dead. And people who know 11, the- 11,000 dead, yeah. 1,100 of the Kurds dead yeah. and uh, multiple numbers, uh, uh, you're right, 11,000. Mm -hmm. uh, multiple numbers injured, of course, on, on the battlefield, and any of us who saw what the Kurds could do in the battlefield, came away impressed. These are tough, disciplined people, and, and this is the oddity, they're pro-American, my goodness. Uh, almost the only uh, people in that region who are dedicatedly pro-American, why? Because they think we'll help them get their own country. 30 million Kurds split among four nations, none of which particularly like them, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and Syria, and the Turks really don't like them for various reasons and American uh, military had been pushing back on the Syrian forces there at the border, keeping them from sweeping into Syria and destroying the Kurd uh, encampments. There are uh, tens of thousands of civilian Kurds living in various cities and towns along that border. It isn't just, as the President of the United States said rather appallingly, uh, just two people fighting in the sand, like children at a, uh, at a schoolyard battle. It's right. women and children and they live there, and the Kurdish Peshmerga, a very tough fighting force, had been protecting them with help from the United States of America. Our right. president makes a phone call or takes a phone call, and suddenly we're moving out, and the Kurds have swept across the border. Then he tries to get a You mean a the Turks, Turks have swept the across Turks the border? The Turks sweep across the border into Syria. The Americans, uh, our troops, leave. Uh, Trump ups it and says, well, let's take all a thousand of our people out of northern Syria, and we're doing that. Well, it's let appalling. me get to that, uh, that, that phone call. He, he, Trump revealed this strange letter to President Erdogan of, uh, of Turkey warning he's going to destroy their, their economy if they roll the Kurds. Of course, he okayed that, as you noted. Don't be a tough guy. Don't be a fool, he writes. Uh, Erdogan apparently threw that away, according to several reports. <laughs> Republican staunch Trump ally, Lindsey Graham, he called... Uh, he, uh, ba he bashed Trump over this, um, and uh, Trump called for former Defense Secretary James Mattis. He called him the world's most overrated general, called Nancy Pelosi a third-rate politician. He blasted the Kurds. Um, this is quite a day, even in Trump world. Insults and mocking and those little performances he puts on at the rallies. Had one in Dallas the other night. Uh, these are full employment acts for people checking, fact-checkers. The one for the fellow from CNN said there were something like 27 major uh, errors, lies in that performance that he gave uh, there in Dallas. And this whole idea that this deal he has cut with Erdogan is a great day for civilization, really. No one who's on the ground, uh, Nick Robertson of CNN, uh, Richard Engel of NBC, they're not seeing it like that at all. They're seeing people desperately fleeing, 
the Turks still bombing. More uh, deaths and violence more even deaths. Of course, today. the Russians are now involved. Right. Uh, the Trump invited the Russians in. The Kurds, our allies, have cut a deal with the, the butcher of Damascus, with Assad. It's worse yeah. than it has been, and it's been bad, and now it's worse. Well, as I mentioned at the open, we had, uh, of course, a long uh, Democratic debate here, and we're going to give uh, a soundbite here to a few of these folks who not quite understandably and, and predictably unloaded on Trump. Let's hear that. We have an erratic, crazy president who knows not a damn thing about foreign policy and operates out of fear for his own reelection. This is about Donald Trump, but understand, it's about the next president and the next president and the next president and the future of this country. The Sir, impeachment must go forward. Uh, I think that the House will find him uh, guilty of, worthy of impeachment because of the emoluments clause. This is a president who is enriching himself while using the Oval Office to do that, and that is outrageous. I don't really think this impeachment process is going to take very long, because as a former prosecutor, I know a confession when I see it. And, and he did it in plain sight. He has given us the evidence, and he tried to cover it up, putting it in that special server. All right, that was, of course, Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, and Kamala Harris in, in order there. Priya, I wanted to ask you, considering your current service in the Navy Reserve, what are your colleagues in the military saying about all this? Yeah, so it's kind of interesting because obviously uh, as a military service member, you're not really supposed to be publicly talking about this. But as a reservist, a lot of us have civilian jobs where we have to publicly talk about this. And I can say that, you know, a lot of my friends are across the spectrum politically. But what was fascinating was this was the one issue that it seemed to sort of unite everybody uh, in they were sort of appalled that this happened and they felt like it was very disloyal. And I think what's also fascinating about this is we saw retired Admiral William McRaven actually had an opinion column in the New York Times yesterday. Um, we also saw Mattis sort of poking fun at Trump um, yesterday as well. And so you're seeing what's fascinating about this administration is you're seeing more top level retired military officers speaking out against so many of the things that the commander in chief is doing and that trickles down all the way to you know people of my level but i think he has but i think what's interesting you know you brought up the republicans and this is really the first time the republicans have really had you know a, almost a unified split from the president and in a way uh the you know the the military reaction both the the retired and the the really the people in the military that are are chafing at this uh, I think emboldens them to do that. It's not a popular thing right now. It looks really bad uh, on TV and elsewhere and in the world diplomatically. But also just politically, I think it's, you know, in the long run, is this going to really be that big of a, a fissure with the Republicans and the president? The president always, you know, he, anybody that crosses him, he gets, you know, he takes retaliation. But I think in a way, this is a safe thing to show that they, for once, can you know oppose the president on something because they've been his lapdog for so long yeah. and they can look tough and standing up to him on this. I don't think the public really knows, has a good, good feeling for this yet. We're all initially appalled and so forth, but you know, it's a geopolitical thing that right. most people don't understand the, the Middle East. I think so quickly, I think in the long run, I'm, it's I'm not right. gonna... I'm right. I'm with you, Michael. Yeah. It uh, is not going to change the Republican. In the Senate, they're going to coalesce and block or find innocent uh, yeah, presidents totally if it goes that way. Yeah, I think this is totally separate from the, um, and also the impeachment. Th the larger matter, most people don't care about the Middle East. He will have a uh, mantra. And it will be, I brought the troops home. But he I didn't. They put 3,000 more in, uh, in, uh, and, and Israel, or in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia think, this week, and 11,000 So what you're saying May. is he's saying something that's a lie, and you think that'll <laughs> Doing matter? The other. Well, he will say that and we'll say that. We'll find out. There's camels that break straws back, um, or straw that breaks camels back. <laughs> or something. <laughs> Let me uh, shift to impeachment, because you brought that up here. Um, we had a number of appearances that uh, Trump and the State Department uh, tried to block here, and they came and testified anyway. This is closed hearings, but we're getting the statements out from a number of these State Department department officials, all having to do with this uh, shakedown of the Ukraine, uh, this uh, Trump's uh, whistleblower and his transcript that he released, and we've talked about that before on the show. Common narrative now between all these hours of testimony. Yeah, I think we now know the, uh, the narrative that the two sides are going to use. I think he'll be impeached uh, in, in the uh, House, the democratically run House. They'll impeach the Republican-run Senate, will, uh, will not find him guilty. And they will say, not that he didn't do it, but rather the process, the process, the, like good defense attorneys everywhere. The process wasn't good. It was unfair. Uh, people took notes in pencil rather than pen. Uh, I heard that used once in the court here. Uh, 
So that's what it will be. And then he will run out and claim total victory. Uh, and away we go. And then and the, we have an, an election next year. But the polls, Michael, are showing that the public's moving that way toward impeachment and removal, 51% yeah, I mean, this week. If you look back, it is interesting that, that his uh, the polling does show a, a slight majority now favoring impeachment. And removal. Uh, and, and removal. Um, you know, you go back to the, the when, when Nixon got into trouble with Watergate, uh, he was uh, impeachment and removal was like 19% support at the beginning of the Watergate hearings. That changed over time. So that shows how far ahead Trump is in that regard. On the other hand, you go back to, to uh, the, the Clinton impeachment, and the public, they thought overwhelmingly he did what he was accused of doing, that, and that to a lesser degree, but a majority thought he obstructed justice. But they just didn't think this was an important enough thing to remove a, what was then actually a pretty popular president by today's standards. Right. Um, so I think that, that uh, the, the, the Senate will be looking at that. They'll be looking at the, uh, the state chessboard, not the nationwide popular opinion on this, because Trump has never been very popular. All and right. he has weaponized uh, Twitter. He's got uh, a uh, whole uh, media strategy that includes all the way from the Wall Street Journal editorial page to people putting out podcasts in their mother's back bedroom. Uh, and they'll, they'll say the same thing over and over and over again. Those Democrats, they're awful. Well, we'll and see how many the there are. That's the, the problem. Are we going to move on? And we didn't even get to uh, the death of Elijah Cummings this week, which is unfortunate. Or Trump giving his uh, G7 summit, G7 summit uh, business a no-bid contract to his own uh, Doral Country Club there in Florida. We'll save those for another show. Too much to talk about. And keeps us in business, doesn't it? We're going to move on. The 50th, most, uh, mostly in East and North San Diego County, is one of California's few congressional seats held by a Republican. Trouble is that re that Republican is under federal indictment, and neither he nor three other GOP candidates in the 50th earned the endorsement this week of the San Diego Republican Party. And uh, Priya, let's start with uh, who's running and why nobody on the Republican side earned that endorsement. Right. So right now we have four major candidates, um, former Congressman Daryl Issa, State Senator Brian Jones, former city councilman and radio host Carl DeMaio, and then, of course, the incumbent Duncan Hunter. Uh, it was really fascinating to see what happened on Monday. All four of them appeared in uh, the San Diego County uh, Republican debate to try to win an official endorsement from the committee there. So the committee is made up of 49 members. Um, those are six people elected from each assembly district that touches San Diego County. Each assembly member who is Republican also gets a vote. Each state senator that's Republican. So Brian Jones and uh, Pat Bates gets a vote and each Republican congressman gets a vote. So they need to get a two thirds majority to get an official endorsement and nobody was able to get that. That would be 33 votes. Um, there was a photo that was obtained by the Union Tribune that showed that Daryl Issa in one of the rounds of the voting got zero votes. Carl DeMaio and Duncan Hunter or sorry. Duncan Hunter and Brian Jones got 14 each, and Carl DeMaio got 21. So really fascinating. This is the first time that Duncan Hunter hasn't gotten a, an official endorsement from the party. And at least according to that one round of voting, it looks like Carl DeMaio was a front runner. And Michael, how important is this endorsement? And well, what does it say about Hunter the incumbent? It's important in that, that the party infrastructure <coughs> can certainly help a candidate. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, I don't know, because Republicans endorsed candidates have not done well down the line. Uh, but that's, uh, I think, a, a product of the overall political dynamics and not so much the, the party infrastructure, which has been pretty pretty well funded and, and doing pretty well in terms of uh, its discipline and so forth. But I think you've got to look at it in the fact that there's four pretty big name Republican candidates that have support among various folks. I think that a lot of folks didn't want to endorse. I mean, they couldn't endorse Duncan Hunter. I mean, he may be in jail for all we know, and, and uh, that would, you know... Come the time of the primary. Yeah, right? and, uh, you know, there were various factions, uh, you know, th that it was interesting that, uh, as we, you talked about the that vote, I think that was an initial vote, because it was one of these process of eliminations where Daryl Issa lost and was sort of booted out of the round, and then Carl DeMaio was booted out of the, a subsequent round. So in the last two, it was actually uh, Brian Jones, the state senator, and, and uh, Duncan Hunter. Jones got the most votes, we're told, but not enough for the two-thirds. So it was an interesting thing that two of the real well-funded candidates didn't even make it into that final round. And everybody's talking about, well, who actually got the most votes? Who cares? Nobody got the endorsement. Well, give us an update overall. I'll do a little step back. Who uh, Remind us who's on the Democratic side here and how the primary is going to work in this infighting among the Republicans. Well, That's an interesting dynamic. It, it is, but it, it, it happens. Um, you know, the unique thing is, of course, we've got the Duncan Hunter situation, and an incumbent in this district should never have any problem or serious opposition, but uh, his legal problems have, have 
given pause to a lot of Republicans, which is why you've got some, some people in there thinking that we could actually lose this at least for a couple of years. And just to remind people, uh, pending an appeal in December, he's due to go to trial in January right. on campaign yeah. finance. But anyway, uh, Amar Kampanajar is the Democrat. He ran against Duncan Hunter uh, last year in 2018, came very close to beating him in a very Republican district. Uh, he, ran, uh, he ran a good campaign, but it was more a matter of you know, Duncan Hunter's problems and people being concerned about that. Uh, so he's, he's, unless lightning strikes, he's almost certain to make it to the uh, November election. We ha do have the top two primary where the two mo top vote getters, regardless of party, advance. In theory, two Republicans could, but I think that the, the field is just so split up among some pretty well names that, that you're not going to get that kind of situation. So he's r raising money. He's working hard, uh, keeping a bit of a low profile, certainly than compared to the other guys. But the one thing is that he's certainly not going to be in the line of fire like he will be in November and like he was last year. Yeah. You said he ran a good campaign. Tony? It seemed overly careful, I thought. Mm -hmm. I kept waiting for him to become the West Coast version of uh, Alexandro Casio Cortez, <laughs> and he never did. Well, no, uh, that because will, that, that you, was a whole philosophic thing. Do I you think, think I he'll think... be a little more, give us a little more juice this time, or still it, very careful? It, uh, it might depend who he runs against. I mean, you know, I think one of the things he did smartly is he didn't get in the way. I mean, the Duncan Hunter situation was such a problem. Yeah. Sometimes it's best to, you know, to to keep moving forward. But but why, you know, if something's working for you, why tinker with that, so to speak? Well, I, I don't think there an you know. AOC strategy would really work would in the work. 50th. That's the thing. You know, I spoke to Amar, and he said he's really focusing on the 60 percent of voters in the 50th who he believes are Democrats, um, independents, or moderate Republicans. Mm -hmm. So he said that you know one tactic that all the four Republican candidates are trying to use against him is, oh, you know, he's a sure vote for Nancy Pelosi for Speaker of sure. the House, and he said he said very vocally that that's not the case, that he's not 100% sure that he would vote for Nancy Pelosi. Is, so he, I think, is he a socialist? Uh, I mean, he would definitely say no, not <laughs> at all. But of course, that's what, you know, these four guys were saying. Well, he ran a that, real moderate campaign. In that debate. Yeah, absolutely. But he's a little more seasoned. I mean, he's been through a campaign. Any candidate who's right. been through a campaign is, is a little older and wiser and smarter and got some scars to, to show for it. But I, I think that uh, the Democrats are concerned that uh, look, they, they like him. They've got a shot in a district that they shouldn't have any right having a shot in. But if he's not running against Duncan Hunter, uh, any of the other Republicans, a pretty good bet to win. Anything can happen. So we'll see what happens. Now, um, the, as you say, the primary is going to be quite a bit different from the general. I mean, it's all, all the focus is probably going to be on those four Republicans battling out. Sure. What happens if, just as a mechanical thing, let's say there's a conviction and you've got Duncan Hunter still on the ballot for the primary, but he's imprisoned or, you know, out on pending appeal or something. Well, uh, he could get the most votes and still be on the ballot in November. That, that can happen. Uh, you know, there, there's a November deadline that, that you cannot withdraw from the ballot after that, regardless of what happens. We've had some cases where people decided they wanted to withdraw and didn't realize that, and their name ended up on the ballot. So they're stuck. Uh, I, I just think because it's such a high-profile race, and that would be such high-profile news, uh, you know, he's going to be on the ballot. He might get some sympathy votes, but uh, he's he's not going to yeah. be a top two vote getter. In the All primary. right. Lots if, of if he is convicted, the, his own house has to boot him out, right? right? He does, he does vote. Out he, as you've pointed out, he's not on any committees any longer. Right. He's kind no. of dead congressman walking at this right. point. Right. To a degree, yeah, which is, uh, you know, everybody's trying to say nice things about him for more, more or less on the Republican side. Some mm -hmm. are. Uh, but they just say, look, you know, his effectiveness is an issue and uh, the district needs somebody that can... All right, lots more on that going forward. We'll leave it there for today and move on. It was known as the World Series earthquake, the epicenter in the town of Loma Prieta. The entire Bay Area felt the 6.9 magnitude earthquake, including those assembled in Candlestick Park for Game 3 of the World Series between the Giants and the Oakland A's. And this was major national story. Here's a bit of coverage from PBS NewsHour 30 years ago, October 18th, 1989. Begin with a look at the devastation as it unfolded yesterday afternoon and evening for a third generation San Franciscan, reporter Spencer Michaels of public station KQED. All it took was a glance at San Francisco's skyline and the smoke in the air just before dusk to realize that this earthquake was having major effects. For most people, the first concern was calling home. But since the power had gone out at the moment of the quake, phone lines in many offices were dead. At TV station KQED, technicians rigged up a bank of phones that did... Oh, Are you okay? San Francisco, Sacramento. Yeah, but I can't get home. Los Angeles. They fell, the bridge fell down. The smell of natural gas still hangs heavy on this city, 
and the fear of more shaking is real. What still is hard to believe is the realization that San Francisco has experienced a major disaster and most of us survived it. Gary, that was a big quake, but we've had several large ones uh, since there. Kind of give us the, the scope of that, some of the, the major quakes we've had. That was a big one. I think the thing that changed a lot is what came after the Northridge earthquake in 1994. You may remember this, this was another surprise. It was on a fault that was not known to exist. The Easter Sunday earthquake in 2010, that showed scientists that energy from one fault could really jump much further than anybody really understood. And we all felt that here. It was just we south sure of Mexico, did. yeah. And then Ridgecrest is showing that um, one quake can actually activate a fault that in most ways is, uh, it seems to be dead. There's a, you know, millimeters of movement. So we've gone one after another after another. Fortunately, during that period of time, scientists have been putting together an early warning system. Started in the early 1990s, it's begun rolling out. We now have an app called My Shake Alert. It was kind of tested in the uh, Ridge, Quest, uh, Ridge uh, Crest. We earthquake. should say that that's a desert community, small community east of Los Angeles. Right. Um, the whole idea there was that it would warn people in Los Angeles and only if they thought there might be damage. That was the problem. The test wasn't so good in that sense. It was limited. Now the new app and what they're doing there, you can uh, find out if there's been a big earthquake if you're anywhere in, um, in California and you do have this app. What it's going to do is it's going to set at 4.5. If a 4.5 is occurring, then it will send out an alert to people who have the app on their phone or some other uh, software device. So that or above can cause some damage and, or possibly injuries. Yes. Deaths, yeah. Now the focus really isn't so much just on damage. What they're trying to do is give a warning in a situation where people might be scared. Mm -hmm. um, that's what happened in Ridgecrest. Ridge Crest. Uh, a lot of people here in San Diego County were very startled by the shaking from that. They didn't know where it happened and if more was coming. So the whole idea here is to warn people broadly, not just in one area and one circumstance. Tony, you're about to say something. <laughs> <laughs> How much warning you're do we get? About, That's you're talking you're about scared say. people. I'm one of them. Uh, <laughs> all right, we've had Compton, two in the last uh, day or so, Ridgecrest, Northern California. Are we getting closer to the big one? It's impossible to know. Someone else asked I'm me that. I'm still scared. A lot, well, a lot of it is background um, uh, noise. I mean, we're moving constantly. The earth never stops moving. So we've had a lot of uh, 2.5s, 2.8s out, say, near um, uh, Borrego Springs. We had something closer to the coast. That could be just background noise. What Ridgecrest did is not really clear yet. Um, it's, you know, it seems to have started something on the, um, uh, the Garlock Fault, but it also may be redistributing energy on the Southern San Andreas Fault. So it's spreading out. And it's just, they don't know what's going to happen. And the scientists uh, are saying exactly that. Well, since these big quakes, several things have happened. We've done a lot of uh, new construction is, is, is much better retrofitting in many areas and bridges, and we've seen that a lot around San Diego County. Right, we got a lot of, uh, rid of a lot of the masonry uh, buildings. Building codes are so much stronger. Um, freeway codes and bridges are much stronger, partly in due to UC San Diego. They have that big shake table out there in Scripps Ranch. So our design is better. But I, I would point out that um, the limits of what uh, the scientists know are really there. I remember in the early 1990s, Tom Heaton of Caltech telling me that he thought that um, skyscrapers might collapse in Los Angeles under some circumstances. And a lot of people at the time said, no, that couldn't happen. And now that we know that under certain circumstances, that could happen. So we've been lucky here. We have been lucky, particularly in San Diego. Yeah. But you know what this says to me? With Ridgecrest seeming to start the Garlic Fault, what else does it start? Does it have any effect on the uh, Rose Canyon Fault right here in downtown San Diego. They don't know yet, that's a fault that doesn't move a lot, but San Diego State has been investigating that very fault for a long time, and they keep finding out that actually it goes off more and more frequently than they understood. So a tail could wag the dog at some point. Oh my God, it could, it could. Now, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask about was they've, they've studied that w the quakes themselves, they're getting far more sensitive, and we're having way more quakes, little tiny ones, than we ever dreamed, right? I mean, by exponentially. Well, more. we're doing a better job at sensing what actually happens. So the uh, sensor network that's put together by Caltech, UC San Diego, San Diego State is involved, it's so dense now. After what happened at Loma Prieta, and then after Northridge, they really push for putting sensors everywhere. And they have them, but we also now have these. These are sensors. Uh, the My Shake Alert. The, those on the radio, you're pointing to the app on your phone. Yes, yes I am. <laughs> the, um, the, um, so uh, more, almost 700,000 people have signed up for the My Shake app. 
And so that's 700,000 um, sensors, additionally to what exists. And uh, a couple of seconds left here. What can individuals do, homes, apartments, residences, uh, to prepare? A couple of different things. Make sure you understand drop, cover, hold on. Very simply, if it's, we begin shaking, drop, cover your head as best you can, and reach for something to hold on to. That has worked very well. The training that the state and scientists have done on that is very, very good. Do have these sensors. You know what I'm doing? I tell people, um, take a box that you might get from the shopping center, put it in the back of your car. Each time you go to your car, put in an earthquake supply, water matches, a piece of clothing. Be ready. Soon it will be filled. All right, we're out of time, but we'll have more on this as we go along on all these stories. And that does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guest, Priya Shreether of KPBS News, former Los Angeles Times reporter Tony Perry, Michael Smolens and Gary Robbins, both of the San Diego Union Tribune. And a reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. Take some time, because there's a lot there and a lot to read about. I'm Mark Sauer, thanks for joining us today, and join us again next Friday on The Roundtable. <laughs>